welcome to The Rippy Effect. I'm Jackie Hunter, your host, and since this is our first season, I want to tell you the reason why I'm doing the show. One of the reasons that I'm doing this show is because I am very concerned, very upset about students who are graduating from college, owing a lot of money and a lot of debt, and can't even find a job in the field that they're majoring in. And so what I'm doing with this show, I'm encouraging young people to seek STEM careers. If you don't know what a STEM career is, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And on my show, I will have guests who are in STEM careers. And I hope as you're watching, you'll see a career that you're interested in. Tonight I have with me Lynn Lennon, and Lynn is a neural feedback technician. Welcome to the show, Lynn. Thanks, Jackie. You know, I've heard of biofeedback. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of biofeedback, but not many people know what neural feedback is. Would you tell us what neural feedback is? Sure. Um, I would actually backstep a little bit just because there are probably a lot of people that don't know what biofeedback is. So I'll kind of encapsulate that and then I'll answer your question. So biofeedback is when we take data off of the body and then we feed it back to the conscious mind. And, and through that process of education, the brain and the mind is then able to better regulate itself. And things that were once automatic or what we call autonomic can become more conscious. Mm -hmm. So someone can choose the kind of state and state regulation that they have. So neurofeedback is just a fancy form of biofeedback. Um, neurofeedback is a subset of biofeedback. Mm -hmm. The main discriminant or the main difference between the two is that with neurofeedback we're taking brainwave information real time mm -hmm. and then we're putting it through a computer interface and we're feeding that information back to the brain real time. And we do that through the form of either a video game or a movie mm -hmm. that is kind of encapsulating, that has the data within it. And the brain recognizes it itself within three to five minutes and it realizes, oh, this is me, I'm looking at myself. And uh, the brain immediately starts to use that data mm -hmm. and to learn to regulate itself more optimally. Uh -huh. Stop for a moment, you said the brain recognizes itself? Yeah, it's, it's really kind of magical. Um, don't forget, the brain is the most magnificent processor in the known universe. And um, so it, it is, its capabilities way outshine anything that we're really even able of conceptualizing. Mm -hmm. um, it's better than any computer you've ever met. It's I can phenomenal. imagine. And so it recognizes, it's, as it's looking at the data coming back at itself, really we're kind of hijacking, so to speak, the dopaminergic system in the brain. So mm -hmm. um, the brain has a reward circuitry built into it called the dopaminergic system. And the brain doesn't really care about the request that I have, as the technician, have made upon the client of client's brain. Mm -hmm. The brain really wants the goody goody or the cookie, so to speak, of seeing the movie or seeing the video game, having winning points in the game or whatever. And the brain simply wants the excuse to run the dopaminergic system. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the content of the movie is the reward. And so through that lure, and uh, basically it's it's operant conditioning, but it's operant conditioning plus more. I mean, there's some, kind of some other things going on that we don't, that haven't been fully articulated. But operant conditioning is the main mechanism. So I'm giving the brain a reward. Um, brain, if you do what I request, mm -hmm. you get to see um, the movie that you have selected. Mm -hmm. I don't really care too much what people watch as long as it's not violent or too limbically uh, emotionally disturbing or anything like that. If they're watching a funny movie and they want to be um, entertained, so mm -hmm. that is that becomes the inherent reward. Mm -hmm. And the, the important thing to point out is with biofeedback, we're interfacing with the data, um, with the conscious mind. So if I ask somebody to learn peripheral temperature biofeedback, they actually have to consciously engage with the data. One of the, the advantages of neurofeedback is you engage with the brain beneath the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it can be beneficial even for people that are in a coma. It can be beneficial for people that are not even conscious. Um, so that's a huge, huge benefit of the mm -hmm. neurofeedback. Um, so, so let me see if I can put this in layman terms. So are electrodes attached to the head so that you can read the brain waves? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's how it's done? Yes, it's and not medical grade equipment, but it's, it's very similar to medical grade equipment. 
And so we're taking the data off of the brain and feeding it back to the brain. The other major discriminant between biofeedback and neurofeedback is, is the brain is um, naturally, inherently neuroplastic. So it is always rewriting its hard drive mm -hmm. and regenerating itself in response to the conditions and the demands that are put upon it and the stimulus that are put upon it. So if you do peripheral biofeedback... Um, so you want to tell the audience what peripheral biofeedback is? Oh, so that's is. just the, the more traditional biofeedback. Okay. That, that doesn't involve brain waves. If you okay. just do more traditional biofeedback. For, um, give, give us an example of, of just that kind of feedback. That kind of, bio, bio so feedback. like a traditional biofeedback would be, for instance, if you came to me and you had migraines, mm -hmm. and um, biofeedback has been widely you know, proven to help with migraines. And there's a, the basis behind all of that has to do with the, the basic physiology of the body. Often migraines are tied to vasculature issues within the brain mm -hmm. and blood shunting issues within the brain. Mm -hmm. If we can encourage the vasculature to dilate and then engorge with blood, mm -hmm. typically the migraine will ease. Not for every different form of migraine, but for a lot of them. So if I ask you, if I put a little temperature sensor on your finger mm -hmm. and I say, well, Miss Jackie, your temperature on your finger right now is 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Your goal for this week is to bring that up to 93. Every time you do the biofeedback exercise, I want you to get that up to 93. I want you to get it to the 95. The only way you can do that is by activating your parasympathetic nervous system, which so, is a rest and digest form of the nervous system. So what you're saying is that I would just focus on increasing that temperature just by thinking about it. Yeah, that, okay. that's a little bit of, um, you know, unknown territory for every person about how they learn to do that. But, mm -hmm. but the brain does figure out, oh goody, I'm doing it. Look, I, I'm getting mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. And they have the reward of the headache easing and getting better. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a learning, a learned skill where you learn um, to not be in fight or flight, essentially. From many, many, many of the applications that we use biofeedback for, mm -hmm. it is to train people to not be in fight or flight because that's the default um, mechanism. So that could be the people have trouble with that. So that could be the thing that could be causing anxiety in someone, or well, it's chicken and egg. Yes, it mm -hmm. can be causing the anxiety, but it can also be um, due to anxiety kind of recursively, mm -hmm. so causing anxiety due to anxiety, mm -hmm. but we need to stop the cycle. So is it teaching a person a different way of behaving under certain kinds of stress, maybe? Well, I think the, the phrase that is probably the most used is state regulation. So we're teaching neurological state regulation, so we're educating people on how to recognize when they are in fight or flight mm -hmm. and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So one of the most essential basic principles is that of the exhale. So the tenth cranial nerve is called the vagus nerve. Vagus is Latin and means wanderer because this particular nerve is really big and it wanders all through your viscera. And it really... Um, it, it, through the viscera? Through the body, through, oh, the, yeah, okay. through all the organs, all okay. the really important organs. Okay. And so the tenth cranial nerve inhibits fight or flight. And so one simple thing that, that people can do when they're really stressed, um, our whole lives when we've been stressed, people have said to you, take a deep breath, mm -hmm. when actually that's the inverse of what you should do. Um, if you're really, really stressed out, you need to take a deep exhale. Mm -hmm. A long, prolonged, sustained exhale engages the vagal nerve and the 10th cranial nerve and engages the vagal break, oh, which okay. is the B-R-A-K-E, the break on fight or flight. I was going to ask you if meditation, taking those deep breaths in and out, is something that can help. It's um, huge. Absolutely huge. And Sarah Lazar at Harvard has done the neuroscience, the hard science, to back up all mm -hmm. of the benefits of meditation. In a quick nutshell, almost everything that aging does to the brain, meditation does for almost the inverse. Wow. So if you want to not have an aging brain, definitely learn how to meditate and do it regularly. Um, it's huge. It's huge for the cleaning of the brain and the overall health and vitality of the brain. Wow, that's great news. And one other just kind of quick point along these lines, uh -huh. because I'm always big on giving people something useful they can use today that's kind of universal and free. Um, there's something called a five count breath. And the, with the five count breath, you inhale to mm -hmm. a count of five, you take a little pause, then you exhale to a count of five, uh -huh. a couple second pause. If we do this, um, for five to ten minutes, we'll reset our nervous system back to the rest and digest mode. 
Wow. And that will take us out of fight or flight. So we can do, there are a lot of things that we can learn and do with the neurofeedback, a lot of things you can learn to, to regulate your machinery and, and kind of sail your ship properly without the neurofeedback. That's great. That's wonderful. Exactly how long does it take for a person to say they've mastered something or they've gotten rid of some bad way of thinking? Well, um, a hard neuroscience answer to that question is 10,000 hours. Um, in, in neuroscience, we consider 10,000 hours mastery level of, oh, okay. of something. But for the layman to learn a breath practice or something like that, um, the, one of the more kind of useful things to think about is the mantra of neuroplasticity. And so when we're thinking about neuroplastic change, we think about frequency, intensity, and duration. So if someone were to engage with the five count breath practice mm -hmm. with frequency, meaning they're going to do it often, mm -hmm. um, with intensity, meaning with focus, and maybe they're going to commit to doing it for 10 minutes a session instead of three minutes a session, if they optimize the variables of frequency, intensity, and duration, they can make very quick progress. So I've had people make pretty massive progress and turnarounds pretty quickly. It really has to do with their motivation and their willingness to make efforts. Hmm. So interesting. Yeah. So it helps people with anxiety and migraines. What about people who are having problems sleeping? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, their feedback and biofeedback can be one part of a whole um, holistic mm -hmm. uh, you know, focus on those kinds of issues. In general, I'll say that there are two basic kind of people that come to my office. There are the people that come to my office and they've generally been referred by their medical doctor or by their mm -hmm. counselor or by their psychiatrist, psychologist, and they come to me and I'm an adjunct to their care and I help them. Um, sometimes I help them with pretty serious pathologies, um, only working as an adjunct to care. And in those cases, and in some of those pathologies, we're actually kind of building brain and we're building health, mm -hmm. and we're building functional connectivity. For those people, it's a longer timeline. Other people come into my office and they, maybe it's just Jackie, and she just wants a tune-up. Mm -hmm. Got a good brain, don't have any major illnesses, don't have any major um, problems, mm -hmm. just feeling kind of frazzled and stressed out, and you know, need to pick me up, and maybe need to learn optimal performance. So we're taking them from, from surviving to thriving. So there are two major categories there, uh -huh. people. Uh -huh. So when you say building brain, are you referring to, say, maybe patients who have brain damage and need to be rewired? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I got into this, um, not to get into the big long story of how I got into it, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually a fine artist and I got into this um, to help my second son. I have two sons, mm -hmm. um, one is 26 and one is 16, and they, they're both um, high-functioning autistic spectrum type young men, and one of them was brain injured at age three from epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And the traditional medical model didn't have much to offer us in terms of helping him recover from the brain injury from the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And then we had confounding problems with behavior and attention and then ultimately even immunological. And I started studying enough to realize that there was a lot that could be done and I wasn't getting answers from the people that I was asking. Mm -hmm. So I decided to learn it and figure it out myself. And so yes, I can tell you, you can build brain and you can you can build connectivity and can very much overcome um, a lot of things. You may not be, com be able to completely take somebody from a very low level of function to optimal, but in almost every case, if people are willing to work, you can definitely improve the quality of life. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's, and it's, mm -hmm. um, it sounds kind of out there and hard to believe, but um, it's been around for, what, about 25 years, right, at least? Well, neurofeedback has been around, yes ma'am, it's been around since the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, the whole understanding of neuroplasticity probably has a very similar timeline. Um, if someone is interested in reading more on this subject, they can read the books of Norman Doidge. Mm -hmm. He's a very famous medical doctor that wrote two books on um, neuroplasticity, and uh, one is called The Brain That brain that changes itself, and the other one is called the brain's way of feeling. Okay. Now, some of the young people who are watching might be interested in going into your profession. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Uh, it's definitely a, a specialty niche career. Um, in neurofeedback, it's still a very small kind of uh, insular community. 
in one way that's very nice. I have friends all over the world and colleagues over the world, all over the world, and I can you know message somebody in another country, and mm -hmm. you know we have a lot of collaborative sharing that way. Um, right now, you still mostly go study with the people that create the equipment. Mm -hmm. So there are maybe three to five different families, so to speak, of neurofeedback equipment. And then you go study with the people that founded the industry. So that's another exciting thing about getting into neurofeedback right now is um, we're still at the level where you can go study with people like Tom Kalura, who founded Graymaster, and the authors who founded EEG Info, um, or um, the Zengar and the people that founded NeuroOptimal, just to, to drop some names for people in case anybody wants to do some research. But they would have to be an RN to be Excellent question. Right. So it's actually a little bit of a wild frontier right now, and that's probably going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a registered nurse, and I do neurofeedback. Um, most people in neurofeedback are probably master's level PhD, but you don't have to be. It is an unregulated uh, domain. Mm -hmm. Most people have some sort of clinical licensure, either they're a counselor or a clinical social worker, nurse, um, doctor, MD, mm -hmm. a clinical psychologist, something like that. But you can actually do neurofeedback with a relatively low level um, degree. Okay. Right now. So do you have any last words for young people who are considering your field? Any last words for them? Um, I think it's it's about really ready to really explode, and I think that um, the demand is huge and the supply is small. So if anybody knows anything basic about business, it's a good time to get into the market. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing this wonderful information sure. uh, with us. And um, if someone needs to get in touch with you, you have a website available. You want to share that? Um, actually. Uh, uh, I'm kind of a strange duck. I don't have a website. But um, you're on Facebook. I am on Facebook. Uh -huh. I'm Lynn Lennon on Facebook. Um, I'm not highly publicized largely because I can't deal with the volume of business that comes my way as it is. Okay. <laughs> but that tells you it's a good reason to get into nerve. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.